everyone. Welcome to chaos. Maybe not, but I think this is actually going to be the most chaotic video I have ever done somehow, even though it's just poetry. That is because I have been wanting to do more poetry videos, but I haven't had the planning skills to actually like read a bunch of poetry in advance and then make selections. And so I am back home with all of my lovely Norton anthologies, my old friends from college. And I was like, well, there's a good sampling of poems, authors, let's talk about them. And I, of course, picked the Victorian Age Norton Anthology because, of course, I did. What else would I pick? We are going to go through the Norton Anthology. And by go through, I don't mean flip through the entire thing because we would be here for hours. We are going to randomly flip and read random poems and talk about them and see what we find. I kind of did this with Robert Frost where I just flipped through. I figure this will be even more chaotic because there's going to be no rhyme or reason. But let's start. I have flipped to Tennyson. Good old reliable Tennyson. I have done an entire video on Tennyson, but I think there's some poems in here that I haven't read. So let's read one. Okay, there's one called Break, 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 which interesting name, I'm intrigued. And I'm going to put, as I usually do in these poetry videos, I'm going to put like the text here next to me and then I will have links to the poems down below. I usually get them from the Poetry Foundation. So if you would like to read in your head along, it'll be right here. And so this one is Break, Break, Break on thy cold gray stones, O sea. And I would that my tongue could utter the thoughts that arise in me. Oh, well for the fisherman's boy that he shouts with his sister at play. Oh, well for the sailor lad that he sings in his boat on the bay. And the stately ships go on to their haven under the hill. But oh, for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still. Break, break, break at the foot of thy crags, O oh sea. But the tender grace of a day that is dead will never come back to me. This feels very Tennyson, which... Honestly, I feel like every day that goes by, I'm just becoming more of like the English teacher that people make fun of in high school that like overanalyzes everything. But this is so very, very Tennyson. There's a sense of loss and regret and nostalgia. It says it was written in 1834. I forgot when it was that Tennyson's friend Arthur Hallam passed away because the death of Arthur Hallam did profoundly affect Tennyson's work and In Memoriam is largely him working through his grief. I don't know if that event had happened yet, but there is such a sense of nostalgia. Stanza about the fisherman's boy and the sailor lad and it's sort of, oh, to be them, to be carefree maybe, because then as it goes on, oh, for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still this sort of makes me think it's about a loss. I just looked up when Arthur Hallam died because it felt like this was written perhaps for him. And Arthur Hallam died in 1833. This poem was written in 1834. And so this feels like it is mourning the loss of someone. You can never truly like guess the true intention or the true meaning of a poem. And I think trying to do so kind of takes something away from just poetry being poetry. But I do think the touch of a vanished hand, there's a clear sense of loss there and the grace of a day that is dead that will never come back. Again, this sounds silly to keep saying, but it, it's very Tennyson. Like, I think if someone were to give me this poem, not saying I could guess it because I did the first line challenge with Sarah and I couldn't guess any of them. But this is what I love about Tennyson is his ability to convey this sense of loss and this sense of grief. The setting of it, I will say, kind of threw me off a little bit at sea. I did like the rhythm of it. I liked the rhyme scheme. I thought it had very good flow to it, which of course it did. I'm literally, I'm critiquing Lord Alfred Tennyson, the poet laureate of Queen Victoria, like I have any authority to do so. But overall, Tennyson... Love you so much. And the next poet that we are going to read, let's see who we get next. I found some Robert Browning poems, but these are again, like huge, huge poems. And that's like for a class, like an entire class, not for the purposes of a YouTube video. Then I would really become like your English teacher, wouldn't I? I don't think we're gonna do any of these. Caliban, that's interesting. 
it probably took inspiration from the Tempest and I'm marking it for later, but it's literally like seven pages. So I'm not going to read that now. We have a good one now, my friends. We have Emily Bronte. Amazing. And she wrote short poems. Thank you so much, Emily. Knew I could count on you. And the first poem that I see, so it is the one that I'm going to read, is I'm happiest when most away. And it is, I'm happiest when most away. I can bear my soul from its home of clay. On a windy night when the moon is bright and the eye can wander through worlds of light. I am not a nun beside, nor earth, nor sea, nor cloudless sky, but only spirit wandering wide through infinite immensity. I love this poem. It's very short, but I'm already in love and I need to read Emily Bronte poetry. I know I have to do that, but this is my first one ever, I think. And this one gives me the same feelings that Emily Dickinson does, actually. It reminds me of the soul has bandaged moments by Emily Dickinson. Image of a soul being like within this home of clay, I think is really interesting. I sort of think of it like literally breaking out when people go away and when the speaker is alone and away from everything. And then I think the image of the spirit wandering wide through infinite immensity just gives the image of infiniteness. I know that sounds very, very basic. I just have such a vivid image in the way that I have such a vivid image when I read The Soul Has Bandaged Moments of a soul literally breaking free from a prison and wandering away through immensity. And the idea that it can only happen when people are away. I don't know enough about Emily Bronte's life to be able to make any assumptions about what this poem means for her. Because again, doing that with poetry is kind of hard. But from reading Withering Heights, I get the sense the Brontes are, and Emily Bronte are, of course, geniuses. And I think in the time that Emily Bronte was writing, she sort of had to take on a male pen name to be able to be published. And I don't think the kinds of things that Emily Bronte was writing about were really acceptable. I think Withering Heights was a scandalous, scandalous book. And so this poem kind of makes sense to me that the only time the speaker can be themselves is when everyone else is gone and that's when their soul can break free. And so this makes me want to read more about Emily Bronte's life. Again, transplanting biographical details onto art is hard, but I don't know, that's kind of what I always did as a student, not completely, but I do think an artist's life inevitably informs their art. And so makes me interested to learn more about Emily Bronte and to read more of her poems. Let us continue. I feel like I was expecting to get some like lesser known authors and then all I ended up getting was literally Tennyson and Bronte. Actually, maybe I should have known, maybe I should have known that one of these anthologies would be Tennyson and Bronte, but now we have Matthew Arnold. Is this the same Matthew Arnold? I have to look this up. Is this the same Matthew Arnold that wrote culture and anarchy because I've read that. I guess it is. I had no idea the Matthew Arnold that I was reading as like scholarly reading wrote poems and novels. I'm actually so confused. But let's see what Matthew Arnold can do. Maybe that's actually my fault and like my professor told us that he had a literary career and I completely glossed over it. I don't know but interesting. These are actually kind of long poems, but I'm like so intrigued by this now that I feel like we have to, we have to read one, right? I think Dover Beach is like the shortest we're gonna get. So let's read it. Also, that sounds very familiar. Have I read this before? We'll see. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling. At their return, up the high strand, begin and cease and then begin again, with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal notes of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound of thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear, and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, 
hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help or pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confusing alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. And this is interesting. I feel like there's a lot of potential to take Matthew Arnold's nonfiction writing and his arguments about education and culture and argue a lot about this poem with backing from his nonfiction writing because at first I thought it was just about the sea about the beach and I was when I read the first stanza I was like and eh, I guess Matthew Arnold should stick to prose writing just kidding I just meant like I probably will stick to Matthew Arnold's prose writing and then when we got to the human misery part that was where I was like okay we're we're getting somewhere here I was gonna say this is what I like to see but that would imply that I like to see human misery and no I don't but the dramatic shift of hearing human misery and then about how the sea of faith was once full and then now it's only a melancholy long and withdrawing roar this is a very bleak poem I would say I think especially the last line the way it just goes on and on that the world hath really neither joy nor love nor light nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain and then here we are in a confused struggle seems very very bleak and I know in culture and anarchy he sort of talks about how we can move towards what he calls sweetness and light I don't want to go into all of his arguments here because that's kind of just a lot to do. But this presents a pretty bleak image of the world. I know he did think that things had to change and things had to be done. And so reading this is very interesting. Kind of makes me want to revisit Matthew Arnold and maybe read more of his poetry. Because again, I feel like this would be such an interesting like this topic to discuss or just to learn about. Because at first I just thought it was about a beach. I was like, oh, okay, cool. The tide ebbs and flows fun and then we get this incredibly like long pessimistic ending which is what I find interesting I guess that says something about me as a poetry person don't give me nature give me really long pessimistic bleak opinions about the state of the world but I really like this one it makes me intrigued maybe it made you intrigued to read culture and anarchy I don't know or just read more of his poems which is the quicker thing to do, probably. And we are going to keep flipping. We are having a successful time so far. Oh, Culture and Anarchy is literally in this anthology. Interesting. I didn't have to like do all of my internet research, which was very laborious, typing in a single question. Thomas Henry Huxley. I have read some things by him, but I don't think he did poetry. He's more of a science dude. Sorry, Thomas Henry Huxley. I don't know why I just called you a dude. That seems like a... You probably have like a title or something. I don't know. Anyway, let's continue. Let's keep flipping. Thank you, Christina Rossetti. I don't think I've ever heard of this author before, actually. Maybe I have, but I don't know. We're just flipping to a random poem. Let's read a birthday. My heart is like a singing bird whose nest is in a watering shoot. My heart is like an apple tree whose boughs are bent with thickest fruit. My heart is like a rainbow shell that paddles in the halcyon sea. My heart is gladder than all these because my love is come to me. Raise me a daze of silk and down, hang it with vair and purple dyes, carve it in doves and pomegranates and peacocks with a hundred eyes, work it in gold and silver grapes, in leaves and silver fleurs de lis, because my birthday of my life is come, my love is come to me. Interesting that this is called a birthday. I think I had an assumption about that, and then I was immediately overturned in that assumption when it is clearly a love poem. And then at the end, it brings me back to the original title, which is a birthday. And it says, because the birthday of my life is come, my love is come to me. So sort of overturning the idea of a birthday. I think that's interesting. That's clever because you read the title and then you're like, oh, this is not about a birthday. But then it is about a birthday. It's about the birthday of my life, sort of redefining what a birthday is, I suppose. Other than that, I'm not sure I have much to say about this one. I liked the rhythm, the repetition of my heart is like, is like, is like, and then is gladder than all of these. And then the same thing sort of in the second stanza, we have kind of repetitive lines about all of these things to adorn. And then at the end, it switches to because the birthday of my life has come, 
my love has come to me. I also think that's an interesting stylistic choice and I like it. Other than that, this is not speaking to me in the way the other ones are speaking to me. So I think that's all I'm gonna say about it. I do think the birthday expectations and the subversion of those ex expectations is interesting, but that's about it. Let us continue, maybe one more if we even find one more because there's actually not that many short poems in this anthology. Maybe they want you to buy the separate anthologies, however much they cost to get poetry. So we are going to go with, for our last one, Gerard Manley Hopkins. Never heard of this author before. Seems to be a very religious author. It seems like a lot of these are religious poems, God's grandeur. Um, there's one that's to Christ our Lord. I'm kind of quite honestly looking for the shortest one. Um, they're all pretty short though. Let's go with no worst, there is none, because that kind of seems intriguing. No worst, there is none. Pitched past pitch of grief, four pangs will schooled at four pangs while there ring. Comforter, where, where is your comforting? Mary, mother of us, where is your relief? My cries heave, herds long, huddle in a main, in a chief woe, world sorrow, on an age-old anvil, wince and sing, then lull and leave off. Fury had shrieked, no lingering, let me be fell, force, I must be brief. On the mind, mind has mountains, cliffs of fall, frightful sheer, no man fathomed. Hold them cheap, may who never hung here, nor does long our small durance deal with that steep or deep. Here, creep, wretch, under comfort, serves in a whirlwind. All life, death does end, and each day dies with sleep. I honestly, I don't even know what to make of this one. There's a lot going on here, and this is kind of bringing me back to the days where I would read poetry and be like, whoa, that's a lot. There's the beginning, the pleas for a comforter, cries that are heaving, talks about seeking comfort in Mary, and then I think towards the end, it talks about being comforted and then to come here creep wretch under comfort serves in a whirlwind all life does end and each day dies with sleep i kind of don't know at all what to make of that last line this may actually be one to open up the floor all of these the floor is open for you to comment but i actually want other opinions on this what do you make of this i'm getting just intense images of suffering and then reaching to faith to find comfort in it and then finding the comfort at the end but then it seems like life death does end and each day dies with sleep is really throwing me off and i don't know what to make of it this is the point when the english teacher will just stare at all of the students in the classroom and wait for a response so that's what i'm gonna do that's what i'm gonna leave you with please sound off as to what you will make of Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, No Worst There Is None, and I will leave that here. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this journey. Should I do more of these? I don't know, but this was fun. I discovered some new poets. I discovered authors that I knew of that I didn't know wrote poetry, which is also fun. And thank you for coming along with me, and I will see you in the next video.